Hi, I'm Harriet Diamond from Foodison Health, and as you know, Foodison Health focuses on the concept of food as medicine as a component of the treatment for mental and physical health issues. But we know that now many of you have increased stress and anxiety associated with the social and financial issues of the pandemic. So we decided to bring you Boost Your Mood with Food. We have a fabulous panel of experts with us today. Joining us will be from the Food Network, chef and registered dietitian, Ellie Krieger. We have from PBS, chef Diane Kochilas, who's going to be giving us a great cooking demonstration. Both of these chefs will be teaching us how to use the Mediterranean diet to treat stress and anxiety. And then we also have from Harvard Medical School, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, Dr. Sarah Bellew, and Dr. Jacqueline Wolf. So without further ado, thank you for joining us. And here's Dr. Sarah Ballou. Hi, my name is Dr. Sarah Ballou. I'm a clinical psychologist and director of GI psychology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. I'm also assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. I'm so happy to be here today to talk to you about mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic. At this point in the pandemic, I'm sure it comes as no surprise that COVID-19 has been a significant stressor in the lives of people across the country and around the world. COVID-19 really represents a universally shared stressor that has caused unprecedented upheaval in many areas of our everyday lives. In one study conducted by the CDC, they demonstrated that as of January 2021, 41% of adults living in the United States reported symptoms of anxiety or depression. And this was four times higher than a similar survey conducted in 2019 prior to the pandemic. Interestingly, and perhaps not surprisingly, those who have experienced job loss or reduction of income were more likely to experience symptoms of anxiety or depression during the pandemic compared to those who had not experienced job loss or reduced income. One thing that's been notable from survey studies is that adults ages 18 to 49 seem to be reporting more emotional distress related to the pandemic compared to their older counterparts. And we think that this could be because younger adults are experiencing more upheaval in their day-to-day -day lives. For example, transitioning to working from home, um, transitioning children to remote learning, or maybe being more affected by upheavals in their socialization. We've also seen differences between genders uh, in terms of the emotional effects of COVID-19 with more women reporting symptoms of anxiety or depression compared to men during the pandemic. And importantly, the pandemic has disproportionately affected communities of color with especially Hispanic and black communities reporting more symptoms of anxiety and depression and emotional distress during the pandemic. The pandemic has had some interesting impacts on Americans' relationship with food. Um, some people have reported that they're, they've been eating healthier, and other people have reported that their diets have um, turned more towards comfort food. 54% of Americans are cooking more, 50% are feeling more confident in the kitchen, 29% are drinking more alcohol, and 35% reported gaining weight. And so in light of this all, and with all the data that we have to suggest that people are experiencing more symptoms of anxiety, more symptoms of depression, and in general, more stress and distress during the pandemic. How can you manage stress and distress? The first thing that I recommend is that you be aware of and patient with whatever emotions you're experiencing. There's no right or wrong way to handle living in a pandemic. And I would especially recommend that if you feel that you need help or need some additional support that you seek help from friends or from a professional. I especially recommend that you take care of your body. So exercise regularly if you can, and especially if you were exercising regularly before the pandemic. And of course, eat well. So eat foods that you enjoy and also eat foods that nourish your body and that take care of your body. I especially recommend maintaining routine in your day. And Particularly, I recommend waking up at the same time every morning and trying to go to bed at around the same time every night, especially on the weekdays. But it's really important that you spend five or 10 minutes outside, um, as long as it's not raining or extreme weather. Um, just try to get some fresh air, maybe go for a little walk, or just go stand outside on your doorstep um, and, and get some fresh air. 
meditate. Many people experience uh, huge benefits from meditation. And so if this is something you've been interested in, I would highly recommend looking into it. We can't understate the importance of staying connected with people who you otherwise might have been socializing with. So this might mean phone calls, video calls, meeting outside, but also know when to be alone. So especially for people who are living with roommates or family members, sometimes it can feel like there's really now not a time to be alone. So knowing when to go into your room, close the door and just take a few minutes to yourself is a really healthy and important way to cope with stress. And finally, stay engaged with or start new activities that you enjoy. So this might be crafts, reading, and again, relevant to today's topic, cooking, which can be not only serve to make food that you need to eat, but can also be a really enjoyable pastime um, and something that you, know, you can get a lot of pleasure from. Thank you very much. I'll now turn it over to uh, the next presenter. Thank you so much, Dr. Ballou. I think we've all learned some great tips to alter and improve our dietary and lifestyle habits to maximize our mental and our physical health. So that was really great. Now I'd like to introduce chef and dietitian Ellie Krieger, host and executive producer of the PBS cooking series, Ellie's Real Good Food, and well known as the host of Food Network's hit show, Healthy Appetite, Ellie Krieger is the leading go-to nutritionist in the media today, helping people find the sweet spot where delicious and healthy meat. She is a New York Times bestselling author and a James Beard Foundation and IACP award-winning author of several cookbooks. Ellie is a weekly col columnist for the Washington Post and has been a columnist for Fine Cooking, Food Network Magazine, and USA Today a registered dietitian who earned her bachelor's degree in clinical nutrition from Cornell and her master's in nutrition education from Columbia University. Um, here we have uh, dietitian and chef Ellie Krieger. Thank you so much, chef. Thank you, Harriet. It is great to be here. And on behalf of Foodison, what a wonderful job you all do. So I'm excited to have my part here in talking to you about what is the Mediterranean diet? How does it improve health? What is its connection with overall health? And in particular, what is its connection with mood? How does it help with putting you in a better mood? Which is something I think no matter what we're dealing with, we could all use nowadays. Um, and then also I wanna discuss how actually affordable and very practical it can be. So first of all, what is the Mediterranean diet? You hear this word thrown around. Um, and it's funny because I think of the word diet as a four letter word. People who know me kind of know that I don't like diets. But when we're using the term diet in connection with this Mediterranean diet, we're really talking about a way of life, a way of eating, not one of these diets that you go on and off for 12 weeks. Um, Anyway, so that's the good thing. <laughs> that's the first good thing. Um, so what the Mediterranean diet is, it's a way of eating that is based on the traditional food ways um, and cuisines from the countries that surround the Mediterranean Sea. And that's actually a pretty big piece of real estate, essentially, from the Western side, um, Spain and Italy and Greece and to the East, Israel. Uh, Lebanon. So all these countries over the course of history really have developed these wonderful cuisines and what makes them very unique um, at their core and, and what makes them so healthful at their core is that they're really based on minimally processed foods, seasonal foods, lots of vegetables, whole fruits, beans, nuts, seeds. So mostly plant-based, um, very rich in olive oil, which is so helpful for you. Um, herbs, spices, whole grains, also seafood and dairy such as yogurt. So these are the, the core foods of the Mediterranean diet. Um, and there's a really a focus on what's in season. So seasonal eating, minimally processed, as I said. And another thing, two more things, is it's not just what you eat, it's the way you eat in this region of the world. People tend to really gather, whether it's friends or family, and I think it's wonderful now in our own society, we're able to do that more um, as we've been doing it essentially on Zoom all year. <laughs> um, but 
getting together with people, taking your time with a meal, not necessarily eating on the run, but really respecting and honoring that meal time, eating in a mindful way. And all of that actually contributes to good mood, which I'll get into. Um, but also there's a lot of physical activity sort of built into the Mediterranean lifestyle. And when I was in Spain, um, I actually lived in Spain for a few months uh, at a time. And I, I lived at the top of this hill and all the shops were at the bottom of the hill. And every day these women, mostly women would do the daily shopping and they would go up and down this hill. And really it, it took them a long time because it was a, quite a steep, hill, but it's that kind of physical activity. Maybe it's gardening uh, that is also very popular and common. It's all of these kinds of daily activities that are built into life in the Mediterranean that kind of encompasses that Middle East um, Mediterranean lifestyle. Uh, so let me tell you about the benefits of the Mediterranean diet. So piles and piles of study show benefits uh, across the spectrum of all kinds of health benefits. Um, a, a literature review just came out in July, 2020, which noted uh, a confirmed role in improving heart health, metabolic health, such as preventing and uh, reducing incidence of diabetes and also reducing cancer risk. So there are so many benefits across the board in terms of chronic illness. There's also data in this particular lineup of studies. They pointed out two particular studies showing how the Mediterranean diet in particular can improve health, uh, health um, mental health and mood. Um, and there are many st studies that are emerging in this area as well. Um, three areas, aspects of the Mediterranean diet are particularly strong in terms of showing how the Mediterranean diet might actually improve your mood. One is that because it's so rich in fruits, vegetables, uh, olive oil, those foods are rich in polyphenols. And there are reams of studies showing the benefits of a high polyphenol consumption with improved mood. So right there, just eating more of those foods, which the Mediterranean diet sort of naturally leans you in toward, right there, you're getting a huge mood benefit potential. The other piece of it is that the fruits and vegetables, the beans, the fiber, and, and beans, by the way, beans, nuts, seeds are also rich in polyphenols, um, but they also contribute fiber, uh, which is a pr uh, prebiotic, which helps feed the good bacteria in your gut. And then of course the yogurt, I'll never forget my first experience tasting Greek yogurt in Greece. It was before it was really popular in the US and I just had a spoon of it and I was sort of like, my mind is blown at how good this is. But that also not only tastes wonderful, but it also has um, active cultures. So those are the probiotics. So the probiotics in the foods such as yogurt and other fermented foods and the fiber that's in all those fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, seeds, they work together in your gut to create a healthy microbiome. And that healthy microbiome is very strongly linked with improved mood. So that's a big one. Um, the other mood aspect is that the Mediterranean diet is often rich in omega-3. And that's a kind of fat that is shown also to improve um, and sustain a healthy mood. So omega-3s are found in fish and seafood in general, and also found in certain nuts like walnuts, certain seeds like flax seeds and flaxseed oil and walnut oil. Um, and it's also found in green leafy vegetables. And that is something that is uh, often eaten. And Diane's going to show us more. I, I love watching her cook. So that's going to be exciting. More about getting green leafy vegetables um, in, your, in your life in a Mediterranean style. Um, so those three aspects are really key to the Mediterranean diet's contribution to healthy mood. I'm going to just sum them up again. It's the, the benefits of the polyphenols. It's the benefits of the microbiome building the healthy microbiome, and it's the benefits of getting the omega-3 fats. So in terms of this being very practical, so you think, oh, this is an old world diet. That means I have to be cooking in the kitchen all day like my great-great-grandmother was. No, you don't. 
This can be fast, this can be easy, and this can be super affordable. And one of the things, so I mean, for example, and Diane's gonna show us fabulous easy dishes so to drive this home and, and you're gonna, if you're not hungry now, you will be when she's done. Um, but just something as simple as a sheet pan dinner, you put some vegetables on a sheet pan and roast them, maybe some simple broccoli, potatoes, season them with olive oil, salt and pepper, put a piece of fish on that pan. That is the Mediterranean way of eating in a modern sort of take on it. Doing a grain bowl, maybe with bulgur or farro or a whole grain pasta, for example, um, and piling vegetables on top of that. Um, maybe a little bit of feta cheese, for example, and some olives. Easy, fast, done. Um, one of the things I love is simple sort of roasted chicken and vegetables. Um, or even pan cooked chicken and vegetables with a lovely kind of Greek dressing, which is just olive oil, um, maybe lemon juice or red wine vinegar and some oregano. Uh, so using those fresh herbs. Um, seasonal eating, you know, it doesn't have to be expensive. Go to the farmer's market if you can. And you can, when you buy produce that's in season, it tends to be more reasonable, less expensive. And then you can go ahead and freeze it but you don't have to get stuck in that paradigm. I mean, honestly, life is busy, right? My farmer's market, market is open only on Friday mornings. I try to get there every week. If I can't, there's no shame in taking advantage of healthy convenience foods. And one of the best, most economical ways to go is to take advantage of your freezer. So personally, I always have produce galore in my freezer, such as, um, frozen spinach, frozen peas, frozen corn, frozen broccoli, uh, frozen fruit, berries. For example, you can whip up a smoothie or, um, or simmer them down a little bit with maybe a splash of balsamic vinegar and have that with yogurt. There's a perfect, you know, sort of uh, microbiome, uh, healthful snack or breakfast right there. Um, also shortcuts, in the cupboard. So canned beans, dried beans, these are all very, very um, inexpensive and convenient foods. And I personally always have a stock of all kinds of canned beans in the cupboard. Uh, so that's just another example. And in the fridge, yogurt, hummus, eggs, nuts and seeds. By the way, I keep my nuts and seeds in the refrigerator or in the freezer even where they last even longer. So storing things, having them on hand, you can pull together a meal really quickly and really inexpensively. And Diane, again, is gonna show us some great recipes in particular for that. But, um, but just also one other thing I wanted to mention was sort of nut butters. That's another one. Besides nuts, I always have nut butters around. So can't go wrong with kind of peanut butter or almond butter um, with an apple or in a smoothie with some plant milk, if you want, or dairy milk, a little yogurt. And, um, and make a smoothie with that and some frozen fruit. I mean, that's another, even though it's not traditionally maybe the Mediterranean flavor expression, it definitely is a sort of Mediterranean style of eating. And then do, I recommend highly, take some time, even if you're by yourself. I personally put on some music, I set a table, I light a candle for myself and just really take a moment to enjoy the food rather than eating on the go in a mindless way. And that all can really influence your mood, not only from a biological sort of biochemical way in terms of the food itself, but in terms of the way you approach it. I highly recommend that. So um, let's uh, continue on. I look forward to, to watching Diane cook because it always makes me wanna be in her kitchen. Thank you so much, Chef. That was fabulous. And um, you had um, suggested to me before and I did not do it. I'm going to do it right after we're done. Put my nuts in the refrigerator and keep them fresh because that's very important and it will keep them uh, longer. So, so that's, uh, and thank you so much for everything you said about the gut biome. Um, I'm learning about the uh, gut, gut biome wonderland of the Mediterranean diet. So, so thank you so much. Now I'd like to introduce you to Chef Diane Cochillis, creator, co-producer, and host of the cooking and travel show on PBS, My Greek Table. Diane is an award-winning author. 
She has written numerous cookbooks, is one of the world's foremost experts on the Mediterranean diet. She hails from the Blue Zone Island of Icaria in Greece. And with the power of the internet, Chef Diane is going to give us a cooking demonstration live from Athens, Greece, using foods included on the Mediterranean diet. With that, I'm gonna hand you over now to Chef Diane. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thank you, Harriet and Foodison. And it's great to be in such good company. Um, Ella, you're a tough act to follow. Uh, you kind of put it, you said it all, and you said it all very well. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about what I'm cooking here today and, and maybe a bit about Ikaria, which is kind of a special place and still um, very much a paradigm of, of the Mediterranean diet. Ikaria is a blue zone. Um, it's a small island in the Northeastern Aegean and it's where my family uh, is from. My ancestry is from that island. Uh, it kind of was catapulted to unexpected fame about 10 or 12 years ago when it was discovered to have some of the longest living people on earth. Um, and people and scientists and demographers have come and studied that phenomenon. And of course, diet, you know, they've one, one of the, the, um, the things that they've come to realize is that diet has played a tremendous role in, in the longevity of the islanders and the people who are now, you know, in their late 80s and 90s and even sometimes over 100, for the most part, grew up uh, on more or less a plant based diet. Um, not to say that meat wasn't present in the diet because people have animals on the island, they have chickens, they have goats, um, but animal protein is traditionally eaten throughout the Mediterranean on either you know, special occasions or a big family meal, maybe you know, on Sundays, um, but it's not something that we consume every day. And that in my own life, um, both as a, a, a denizen of the Mediterranean, but also as a parent, I've really tried to uh, do that. I raise my kids to eat, you know, lentil soup and giant beans and all sorts of other things that aren't meat. Um, and in fact, on the few occasions where they, they had to go to kids' birthday parties at fast food places in Greece, which was kind of in, in fashion when they were younger, they would always come home and say their bellies hurt. So I guess, I, you know, I sort of knew I was doing something right. So I'm doing two dishes today and I want to, I want to, talk a little bit about something that you tapped into, Ellie, which is the convenience factor. Um, you know, people have become so afraid of cooking and they think that you have to spend two hours in the kitchen to put out a meal. So what I've done today is I'm doing two really classic Greek dishes that we, they are very popular on the island of Icaria as well. Um, one of them is a green bean ragu that we call fasolakia yachni. Um, and it is essentially, it's a, a technique that one can apply to any, almost any vegetable. It's basically cooking um, onion and garlic uh, in a little bit of olive oil and then adding, whether you're cooking green beans or, you know, flat green beans or string beans or runner beans or uh, soaked uh, dried beans or okra or eggplant or cauliflower or almost anything um, can be um, used in a dish like this. And it's, that's a good thing to know because it, it's, it's, you can apply this technique to anything that's in season. So that's also really important. Uh, the farmer's markets in the Mediterranean are, you know, sight to be seen. Um, it's, they're really a, a great way to understand um, not only what's in season, but how important it is in our own sort of psychology to understand that waiting for things to be in season is actually one of the life's greatest pleasures. And 24, 24 seven availability of things we experience in the United States kind of dilutes, I think the value of many foods. So for example, it's strawberry season in Greece. You know, I waited a year to eat strawberries. So, you know, cherry season is coming up. When cherry season comes around in June, I must go through, I don't know, I must eat a kilo of cherries a day. So this idea of anticipation, I think is very much a part of the diet. But um, you talked about convenience. And I wanted to show people that uh, you don't need um, to have an, a Mediterranean farmer's market uh, in your neighborhood. Um, you can cook most of the foods uh, that are plant-based in the Mediterranean and in the Greek diet uh, by using um, really good quality frozen vegetables. And that's in fact what I decided to do here today. I use, I, I have frozen green beans um, and frozen spinach. I, I would typically do this either or, either with, if it were the summertime, I would probably do it with green beans. I also grow them. Um, if it were uh, in the winter time when spinach is in season, I would probably uh, do it with fresh spinach. 
So just you know, to drive home that notion that it, this is easy food. So starting with, uh, I don't know, you can see me, right? You can see that? I'll, I'll hold this up as I go. But just a very basic technique. We're doing the green beans first. And I am doing something here that is very, very common um, in, it's still common in Icaria, and it's very common in the traditional way of eating throughout the Mediterranean, which is many of these plant-based dishes come in two versions. Uh, they, there's a version that's totally plant-based, vegan, and there's sometimes a version that has a little bit of protein, animal protein or seafood um, or fish added to it. So I wanted to give you an example of that today. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of uh, chicken to this. Uh, you know, just, just as a way, to, I mean, I'm not, I'm a proponent of plant forward food. I think that it's really important to have balance in our diets and eating, you know, animal protein in good measure and, and good quality animal protein. I think that's, Forget, you know, tell me if you agree with this, Ellie. I think that's healthy, but I don't think eating it every day is healthy. Um, I would, I'm interested to see how if you feel, how you feel about that. So I'm just but, sauteing um, some onion and I've got, I used red onion because that's what's most prevalent uh, in Greece. And we just want to soften the onion. Let me raise my heat a little bit. And I'm going to add a little bit of garlic to this. And basically everything goes in here. Um, green bean, I'm going to add my, uh, my meat in a second, a little bit of garlic, uh, green beans, tomatoes, uh, some herbs, uh, a little bit of sea salt. Um, and at the end, uh, just for balance, someone is calling me. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, Oh, just, 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 for, just for balance, uh, a little bit of acid. And in the case of this dish, I'm gonna add a little bit of a balsamic vinegar. Diane, to, um, answer, to address your question about the animal protein, you don't need animal protein, of course. You know, there's plenty of vegetarian oh. eaters, but what's remarkable to me about the human body <laughs> is that there are any number of diet patterns that are optimally healthy. So if you are enjoy and like getting your protein with fish and meat and chicken and mixing that up, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that as, as long as the, the full diet is, is balanced and there are plenty of plants in there. Um, at the same time, there's nothing wrong with eating a, a vegetarian or a vegan diet if it's well planned and you get enough protein. So that's what's cool to me about the whole human body is that we don't have to pick one. We, as a society, as a, it doesn't have to be one size fits all. We can kind of go with what feels right and what we enjoy as individuals, as our, as our, as our families like as well. Personally, I eat very little meat, but when I eat it, I enjoy it. Same here, same here. Sometimes, sometimes I have been known to eat a big fat cheeseburger. <laughs> and I've enjoyed that too, but you know, I won't eat that often. I'll eat it and I'll enjoy yeah. it. And then maybe the next day I will yeah. not eat very much. But you know, it's, I think it is about balance. And there is in fact a Greek expression that has to do with diet, which is pan metron ariston, which means everything, um, everything in good measure basically. So I'm adding a little bit of garlic to this, just some chopped garlic. And I'm gonna get uh, the meat in next. Just wanna get a little bit of color on that. And then I'm gonna add uh, the green beans. And you know, you find this technique of adding bits of, you know, small bits of, of meat uh, to otherwise vegetarian dishes, even throughout Asian cuisine. I mean, it's in, a, in, in essence, in the Mediterranean, this was a way to take a very expensive uh, ingredient, which is, you know, meat of any kind, and to make it, and to stretch it. Because a generation or two ago, people had much bigger families. They had different dietary needs. They were doing much more outdoor work. They were farming, they were, you know, in the fields, it was very different. Urban people were not living in an urban environment where you're basically sedentary for, you know, for large, large chunks of the day. So, but they were also poor. 
So the idea of eating, say, you know, so in Icaria, for example, you'd have, we, we make this um, traditional cured meat with, with, which, with what's available, which is goat. And that would be used in tiny, tiny bits. I mean, in dishes like this, you know, just almost like pulled, almost like a pulled meat, um, very dry, very, it's not, you couldn't eat it on its own. You have to put it in something with liquid. And it was used both for flavor, but also just to add a little bit of protein um, to mm -hmm. a bean soup or a fresh bean stew or a greens dish. What's interesting there for me also, it's, it's more like this using of meat as a condiment, exactly. which uh, is wonderful, but also from a nutritional perspective, what's interesting is when you have some meat and the meat uh, tends to be the best source of iron, for example, because it's a type of iron called heme iron. But when you have some meat in a dish with beans and other iron rich vegetables, you actually absorb the iron from those vegetables even more. I'm sorry, because I had to get my beans in here. Sorry about that. Those look beautiful, those beans. Are those broad beans? They're, no, they're, they're flat, uh, screen, flat green beans. We do have really great vegetables in Greece. But can you, can you I didn't hear what you said about um, the meat. Sorry. When you add a little bit of meat to a dish, it also helps you absorb the iron in the vegetables that are in the dish. Oh, really? Yes. So I think that's kind of cool how it really works together using meat as a condiment in that way, as opposed to it being at the center of the plate. That I didn't know. I, I do know that lemon, I've, I've heard that lemon does that with certain, with, with spinach, for example. And I'm going to actually in the next dish, um, we always squeeze lemon juice over um, our, our spinach and rice. And I've been, I've been told, I mean, I've also read that that, that helps us absorb the iron in the spinach. Um, and those are, you know, I think the other thing about the food in this part of the world is that there is this kind of innate wisdom that science is catching up to. Two generations, three generations ago, people knew this innately. They knew it empirically. They, they couldn't explain it. They couldn't tell you that adding bits of meat helps you absorb the iron better. They kind of knew it because they were really much more mindful of how food affected their bodies and how food affected their overall health. And I think that, you know, that is, is knowledge that was passed down traditionally from generation to generation. Um, I'm gonna add a little bit of tomato to this. Can I ask a question while uh, you're doing that? Um, Ellie, is that true of any protein or only meat? Will protein help you absorb uh, whatever iron is in the vegetables or uh, with any protein or is it only meat? So it's not the protein so much as it is the presence of what's called heme iron. Okay. So it's the type of iron that is in the meat. Um, and, I, and I believe that's in any kind of like mammal basically is heme iron um, or it might be in chicken too. Uh, I'm not sure. That's what I, yeah, I was curious, yeah. I'm not sure if it's in poultry as well, but I know that for sure it's in uh, red meat and that type of iron helps you absorb, the way it's absorbed, it kind of helps you absorb the other iron. And it is true also about the, the citrus, uh, the acid lemon juice or, or vinegars or any type of uh, acid will also help you absorb the iron in plant foods. Hmm. So I have a question as well. Does our need for protein change with age? Because I, I have a 20 year old son, almost 20. This kid can, can down four pork chops <laughs> in, one, in one sitting, three. He's not, he's slim. You know, obviously I couldn't do that at my age, but I, I see that he needs that. And he, he, he tends to, you know, he asks for it. He eats plenty of vegetables, but it seems like his body needs a heftier dose of animal protein. Well, you basically have a human furnace living with you. So he, what he really needs is just lots of calories. So whatever you're serving, that's gonna just mean he's just gonna eat a lot more of it. So I don't think proportionately he needs more protein depending if he's bodybuilding or something that's different. But, um, and you do need more protein when you're like 
marathoners or extreme athletes do need more protein, but they also need more calories. So probably proportionately it's the same, but I think you basically just have an eating machine living with you. I have an eating machine. <laughs> I'm adding a little bit of uh, fresh mint to this. You can add any herb. Um, I happen to have fresh mint in the fridge today. Um, you could add dill to this or fresh fennel, um, anything really that uh, you have on hand. That's also one of the great things about most Mediterranean cooking. Um, it's pretty flexible. So it's easy to swap out, you know, kind of the, the secondary ingredients, um, you know, the, some of the herbs, or uh, maybe you're using, you know, kosher salt instead of sea salt, or, you know, that sort of thing. I think it's important to, to communicate to people that they don't need to get, they don't need to stress out about a recipe. It's, you know, cooking should be intuitive. And once you kind of get the knack of this, it, I think it starts to come naturally. Um, I'm gonna get this and move this over to the back burner. Add a little bit of water to that. And uh, get going on the second dish. Which is uh, the spinach rice which is one of my favorite dishes uh, in all of Greek cooking. I'm actually gonna move this to another burner that you probably won't be able to see because the way that stovetops work, work in Europe, they're not all, they're all different sizes, <laughs> oddly enough. So they have different uh, levels. So the next dish I'm doing is, you know, grains are really important, really important component in the Mediterranean diet. In Greece, um, I would just empirically and just by observation being here over 30 years, the most common manifestation of grains in the Greek diet is probably really good bread. Um, it tends to be a utensil. Most of, you know, of a, people of a certain generation cannot eat without bread. Um, I, I've largely cut a lot, I've cut a lot of the carbs out of my diet, but I use, I do eat whole grains. Um, I'm doing a rice dish today. It's a spinach rice. It's one of the many, many um, um, pilaf. It's not exactly a pilaf because the rice is not fluffy. It's uh, closer to a risotto. And we have many um, dishes like this. There's a spinach rice, there's a tomato rice, there's a leek rice, there's cabbage rice, there's greens rice. And it was essentially, again, another way to take relatively inexpensive common ingredients um, and make them more substantial, make them more filling. So you can feed a family of six or eight or 10, which was the case, you know, a generation ago. And, you know, this is also both of these dishes um, without the meat in the greens dish are part of a category of food um, in the Greek kitchen called lavera. And those are the dishes that are, we, lavi is the Greek word for oil and it almost um, universally is, refers to olive oil. And you can see I've got, you know, I fill it up myself and I'm down to the bottom here. <laughs> and that hasn't, it's only been out a couple of days. Um, could Greeks could consume more olive oil than anyone else in the Mediterranean. I think it's something like 22 or 23 quarts a year per person. And I can definitely attest to that. So these dishes are all under this umbrella term called ladera, which are dish dishes in which olive oil is used as a cooking fat, but also as a condiment, as a garnish after the finished dish, after the dish is done. So you would typically take this off the stove and then drizzle a lot more olive oil over it. And, you know, older cooks, um, I learned a lot of these dishes from actually my husband's grandmother, um, who was a phenomenal cook. And she would always say, you know the dish is done when there's the only liquid left in the pan is the olive oil. And what she meant was that unctuous, delicious, you know, conduit for all of the flavors that, that are, con are concentrated in that those few you know, tablespoons of olive oil left after the dish is done. And that's where the good bread comes in. <laughs> so, um, I'm gonna add um, this, also starts off in a similar way with onion. I also have um, some chopped uh, leek. I got. I can only find small leeks today. 
and a little bit uh, of garlic. Now I always, um, I always add uh, my rice at this point after the, the onion mixture is, is uh, cooked down a little bit. I like to coat it in the olive oil because I think that brings out the nuttiness, it brings out a nutty flavor in the rice. And then I add the spinach, um, you know, salt and pepper or just salt, uh, a little bit of water and basically cook it all together until uh, you get this wonderful, more spinach than rice uh, in the dish. That's one of the secrets to this dish. It's not, it's not rice and spinach, it's spinach and rice. And I think that's also really important. And you can do this with any sweet green. You can do it with uh, chard. You can do it with um, uh, what other sweet greens are there out there? I do it usually with a mix of greens, beet greens sometimes, sweet dandelion. So it's, again, you know, it's very, very versatile. I'm adding um, my rice and I'm using, just let me show you, I'm using something that's very similar, in fact, to a risotto rice. Um, I don't know if you can see that, we call it Carolina. And it's a, it's a round, small uh, grain rice, which has a fairly high starch content. So it gets really creamy. You can also do this with brown rice. Uh, you could do it with other grains. You could do it with bulgur. You could do it with wheat kernels if you've soaked them. Uh, they take a little bit longer to cook. You could do it with quinoa. So again, you can really adapt this food to your own uh, dietary needs or your own, your own preferences. And I think that's also really important. I also think another thing, and please tell me if you agree with this, when we talk about the Mediterranean diet, I, I wanna also think about the carbon footprint that we're leaving. And, you know, I think it's really important to apply these rules to whatever is available and seasonal in your own neck of the woods. So, you know, obviously if you're in Latin America and it's winter time, you're gonna to have tomatoes and you're gonna have grapes and you're gonna have all the stuff that we don't have in the Northern hemisphere. But if you're in Chicago in January, you might wanna think about using, not using tomatoes, not using fresh tomatoes and not using, you know, you wanna think about what is local and what is seasonal. And I think that's really, that's a, that's a, um, a foundational element of the Mediterranean philosophy that we can take with us wherever we are. And I'd, I'd like to hear if you if you agree with that or think differently about that. No, I completely agree. Um, I live in New York. I know you're originally from New York. In the winter, you know, it's all about squash. It's about root vegetables, carrots, all these wonderful um, root vegetables. But I do have to say that I am a huge fan of canned tomatoes. And Ms. I see no reason not to just like, in the winter, I'm all about the canned tomatoes. <laughs> I, I agree. I use them too. I mean, I, what I don't like to see, and I, we see it because of, sometimes because of the insane way that the EU works. Sometimes when I come back from Icaria at the end of the summer or in early September, I go to my local supermarket. I, I have a garden there, so I'm really spoiled. But I come back and I see tomatoes from Holland. Yeah. There's, there's something wrong with this picture. I mean, Greece has amazing tomatoes. Why are we finding Dutch tomatoes in a Greek supermarket at the peak of the season. So that's kind of what I'm talking about. It's, about. it's about staying local as much as you can. And a lot of this food is also, I could easily have made that greens, the green bean dish with winter squash. And I do, there are recipes for that and canned tomatoes or dried tomatoes, sun-dried tomatoes. So it's, the idea is that you have like very, you have very simple techniques and you can apply those um, to all sorts of, of plant-based foods. And you can enrich them and make them more filling with the addition of grains, or you can make them a little bit more special uh, with the addition of protein or see, you know, animal or seafood. So I, it, to me, that's, that's really what the Mediterranean diet um, is all about. So I'm gonna just, um, I have to let this kind of do its thing and cook um, for a bit and let the, let the rice cook a little bit of salt in here. And I'm always, I always use uh, Greek sea salt. And Matt knows from our three years of working together that I personally do have a salty palate. And I probably use way more uh, olive oil than most people do. 
Um, okay, so I'm just gonna let this uh, do its thing for about 15 or 20 minutes. And our spanakorizo or spinach rice uh, will be done. So let me see what's going on with the green beans here, okay. Diane, I know that in Greece they use a lot of, they call it horta. What's horta? Yes. yes. What is and that? Is that a type of green? Horta means greens in general. Okay, so any greens, it's like the category of greens. Yeah, and there are over, there are dozens and dozens of wild greens uh, that people eat here. The bitter greens uh, tend to be, people consider them almost, some people consider them healthier. There's something about bitter food that I think is very cathartic. I remember my dad as a kid would pick uh, bitter dandelions um, off the Grand Central Parkway. We would stop on Sundays. This was <laughs> it didn't occur to him that they were covered with lead emission. But yeah, that's that's because he just he didn't know. Nobody knew then. But and I remember him drinking the juice. He would boil the greens and drink the juice. And people still do that here. It's 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 a very it's a tonic almost. Sure. Um, but we have all sorts of greens and they're seasonal. In the summertime, we have a green um, that's in the amaranth family, not the seed, but the actual green part of the leaf part of that plant, um, which is a, a, the Mediterranean variety. We have um, in the springtime, we eat things like chervil and um, uh, all sorts of you know, sweet and, and uh, sour and bitter sorrel. Um, all sorts of herbs, uh, wild, wild fennel, carrot leaves, um, carrot tops are often used uh, in cooking. Uh, poppy leaves from poppy flowers are often used. Marigold, marigold leaves go into salads in the summer. So there's this incredible uh, variety of um, greens that are used. When you started talking originally about seasonality and that anticipation, I completely agree with you and I just love that notion because I do think food tastes better when you kind of I always say actually hunger is the best gravy and I think there's something about building up a sort of mental appetite for something that makes you you know that increases the, the desire and makes it more satisfying so I believe in that on many levels but from a nutritional point of view I think it's interesting too because variety is so important from a nutritional point of view different vegetables, different fruits have different sort of nutritional profiles. So that if you eat the same thing day in and day out, week in and week out, you're going to be potentially missing out on some things and overdoing other things. Um, so this sense of eating seasonally also just sort of really naturally brings a healthy variety of nutrients to the table too. So I just wanted to kind of add to, to your point there. I think that's, that's an important thing to remember. I mean, for me, it's also, I just, I love that anticipation. I love waiting. I have to do a photo shoot tomorrow and I was looking for peaches. It's a little bit early, you know, it's still early for peaches. I did find them in one market, but it just made me realize, of course, you know, it's the middle of May. Peaches aren't in season for another month, you know. It, there's just something really beautiful about, A, about you, you respect what you're eating more um, you enjoy it more because you've been waiting for it. You know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And you also, I also wonder if there, are, if seasonal food is more nutritionally dense. Is it? Yeah, there is some truth to that because if it's picked at the peak of ripeness, um, it actually, uh, it will have a different nutrient profile than it's picked, than if it's picked under ripe and then transport it and just the transportation. So if you're eating seasonally and you're buying locally and you buy something that's been picked yesterday versus something that had to travel from Holland to Greece, it's going to nutri degrade nutritionally somewhat in that journey. Mm -hmm. But I don't think people should get crazy about it. I mean, it's not like it's valueless. I think sometimes we wind up having this all or nothing mentality about food. Um, and I wouldn't stress about it <laughs> um, because that's not going to help your mood. That's not going to help anything. But just sort of, as you say, just leaning in that direction, leaning in toward more local seasonal is going to be a plus. We, uh, we have uh, uh, some questions from the okay. audience. 
And while that's cooking, perhaps we can um, answer those questions. Um, asking the questions from the audience is uh, Dr. Jacqueline Wolf, who is the other co-founder of Foodison Health. Dr. Jacqueline Wolf is Associate Pre uh, Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and in the Division of Gastroenterology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. So um, Dr. Wolf, uh, why don't you ask some of the questions that the audience has been presenting to us? Well, that's great. And thank you. Those were wonderful presentations. I wanted to expand on what Ellie said and Diane said about seasonality and about freezing foods or using canned foods. Can you comment? Sometimes people want to have onions or garlic, but they don't have it fresh. And can you comment? Can you freeze these things? Do you lose any nutrient value when you have frozen vegetables or canned vegetables versus fresh vegetables? Because many people in our um, environment obviously can't go to the, um, uh, to, uh, the farmer's markets or they don't have access or they're going to the grocery store. So what do you say about those things and tell people? Yeah, that's a great question. So from a nutritional perspective, frozen vegetables and frozen fruit are of comparable nutritional value to, well, frozen vegetables in particular are of comparable nutritional value to fresh vegetables that have been cooked, which, so if you're going to cook them anyway, you're going to have very comparable neck and neck nutritional values. There's really no compromise there. And that's because they're picked at the peak of ripeness. They are frozen very shortly after being picked. And so it really does preserve the nutritional value. And the same thing with frozen fruit. Um, frozen fruit is of a comparable nutritional value to fresh fruit. So in terms of onions and garlic, um, I don't believe you can really buy those frozen, but you know, it's best to chop them from fresh right there. So I always say one of the best things you could learn how to do as a cook in your home kitchen is to learn how to chop an onion efficiently because that will make everything so much easier. But that said, if you want to buy chopped, already chopped garlic, already chopped onion, which is available at most stores, there's no shame in that. And I think we just need, I'm personally, I think we need to let go of this notion of perfection and, and don't let um, perfect get in the way of good, right? So if you're making a home cooked meal and you feel like that chopped onion or chopped garlic is gonna make it easier for you, go for it. I agree. I agree. And the other thing I wanted to talk about, you mentioned probiotic foods, Ellie and Diane and the yogurt that's so wonderful and uh, the other probiotic foods that people eat. I mean, our gut bacteria are there. There's so many, there are trillions and everything in our gut and it helps our health, our, our thinking and everything. And certainly in people with stress, that um, diversity in our gut bacteria um, also is good for our, our health and our mental health. So um, we don't really know about all the uh, probiotic foods. You mentioned the one, do you want to talk a, a little bit or mention either one of you about some other fermented foods that people are using? The Greek yogurt is, is wonderful. Olives. And other things you might use. Well, eat. I think you have to be, so anything fermented. Um, so if you buy, for example, uh, like sauerkraut, pickles, olives, but when you go to the store to buy them, not all of them will be, will have active cultures. So you want to look for the ones that have been, that are fermented and that are in the refrigerator section. Um, so that is one very important thing because here you can buy them on, if you're buying them on the shelf, then they've basically been heated to the point that kills the live bacteria. So looking for pickles, sauerkraut, other types of pickled vegetables. Um, it's not Mediterranean, but it's Mediterranean style. Uh, kimchi, for example, is another pickled food that is uh, high in probiotics. But again, getting the kind that's in the refrigerator section that has that, um, it almost has like a bubbliness to it. it you actually could feel the life in it. <laughs> um, so looking for those. And also uh, drinks like kombucha, 
uh, have probiotics, again, it should say live cultures or be in the refrigerator section, not in uh, shelf stable condition. So not all, uh, just because not all olives and pickles and so on are. So I have a question for, for, for about that because, I mean, before refrigeration, this pickling was the way to preserve food. So wasn't that, weren't those types of foods filled with probiotics? Yes, but the way when you buy them in the, sh on the, in the store today, anything that's on the shelf is typically preserved uh, in heated to the point of killing the bacteria. So just, I'm talking about today uh, for, the mo for most commercial production of these foods. Diane, I thought it was really wonderful and everyone has commented on how you can change your grains and change your rice and do everything for your special diets. Um, and also how you cook the rice. It would appear that you're cooking the rice differently from the way we often cook our rice. We steam it and boil it. Um, does this give it a different flavor and make people, you know, uh, more interesting in the way you're cooking it than just steaming I mean, the rice? <laughs> rice this way, it absorbs the flavors of, of everything else that's in the pan. Um, it's not, this isn't rice as a side dish. That's actually something I forgot to mention that these types of dishes would be served as main courses in the Greek, in the Greek kitchen. So this spinach rice would not be served as a side dish to a piece of fish or a piece of protein, piece of animal protein. This is dinner. Um, I, you know, might serve it with a little bit of feta cheese if I wanted to add, um, you know, something, something else to it, but uh, this, these are main courses. Um, the, when, we, when we serve rice as a side dish, uh, we tend to either uh, cook it as a plain pilaf, maybe with a little bit of butter or saffron or olive oil and saffron. Sometimes add um, things like nuts and dried fruits to it or cinnamon. Um, but these types of dishes, these vegetable rice dishes are main courses and typically um, kind of everyday food. That it, it looks just wonderful. I can smell it now, even though I'm on my computer to eat this. And I can say even in old studies or newer studies, I should say that high fat diets, not the olive oil diets, but high fat diets can actually affect in a negative way the health of certainly animals and make people more anxious. And I think what everyone has said about sitting down with the Mediterranean diet with your family, having a definite time to eat and eating this way in a healthy way is um, helpful for um, your mental health and your regular physical health. You know, something else that's very, um, I think unique about the way we cook vegetables in the Greek kitchen is that we tend to cook them very slowly. I would typically cook the green beans for at least an hour. So they would be by most cooks and chefs standards, totally dead on arrival. <laughs> but um, by cooking them slowly, you also bring out all the natural sugars in these foods and the in vegetables. So there, there's this almost a subtle underlying sweetness in a lot of this food. And I think that's one of the reasons why that coupled with the, the, the generous use of olive oil is one of the reasons why kids, at least in Greece, I don't know about the rest of the Mediterranean, learn to eat vegetables from a very young age. And because it's actually pleasant, it's pleasurable, it's good for, they like it, there's a comfort level to it. So let me just get, um, get this out so we can show you. So I'm not, it's not fancy plating, it's just the way I would serve my, my eating machine of a son uh, on a typical weeknight. But let me just wipe off uh, the sides of the plate. And 
I will get um, a little bit of olive oil over this. So this is, um, I think you can see that this is um, just olive oil, uh, I'm sorry, green beans uh, cooked very simply with tomatoes and herbs, uh, onions and garlic, and a little bit of uh, chicken. And you could add any protein to this. You could add shrimp to it if you wanted to. You could serve it without protein, without animal protein. Um, and I think uh, the rice is also almost there. Let me just show it to you in the pot before I plate it. So you can see that it's really all melded together. And that's exactly what, uh, what we want. Diane, with the um, uh, steam coming out of the pot, we are obviously a continent away, but it looks so good that I'd like to jump through my screen right now <laughs> and, and taste it. This is something, this particular dish I have served, you know, put on many, many a restaurant menu uh, in my other, when I have my other hat on. Um, and we often serve it um, with a piece of fish. In restaurants, you would find this, you know, some, with something that um, justifies serving it for, you know, 30 bucks or something. Um, let me put a little bit of lemon on there. And you want, I would typically, you know, just squeeze a little bit of lemon over the top. I drizzle uh, a, you know, a little bit more olive oil, a generous amount. And if you wanted to, you could just also serve this um, with a little feta. And there you have like, a very simple, but very substantial and really comforting uh, spinach rice dish. And something you, could, you can make any day of the week. Beautiful. Beautiful. Bravo. It's very beautiful and gorgeous. And I just, I personally want to say thank you. I'm coming over, Diane. I'll be there You're in about 24 close. hours. <laughs> uh, and I just, I need to get going. So I just want to say thank you to all of you. And it's been a real pleasure to be here. From Foodison Health, we want to thank all of you for joining us today. We hope everyone who's watching adopts the lifestyle and uh, nutritional uh, tips that we've given you today and that all of you are feeling at the top of your mental game and, and physical as well. Thank you so much for joining us.